Good morning and welcome to Miller Johnson's Myosha and COVID-19 Safety Series, um, part two of the series. This is Sarah Willey um, and I'm here with my colleague, Sandy Andre. Um, and we're gonna be um, talking to you guys today about reporting and uh, recording and record requirements related to COVID to make sure you are all in compliance with Myosha. Um, in that regard. Uh, for those who were able to attend last week, uh, last week we spoke about general Myosha enforcement and the general duty clause. Um, in other words, what obligations do we have um, under Myosha with regard to COVID and what might a Myosha investigation generally look like? So if you weren't able to attend we do have all of our recorded webinars on millerjohnson.com. If you look on our COVID page, it is there. So I would encourage you to listen to that as well. Um, next week on Wednesday, we're going to be talking about um, how to prevent the spread in myosha standards that are applicable to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a few weeks ago, Sandy and I decided it would be a good idea to do a three-part series on myosha, primarily because we were seeing um, an uptick in myosha concerns, complaints, and investigation, and, and investigations as people are getting back to work. In other words, we had many employers um, who had been focused on how to get employees back to work, all the things they needed to do to prepare. Now that we have people back, um, it seems as the, 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 the next focus is largely on um, complaints in the workplace related to myosha and COVID. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it off to Sandy. She's going to um, give the presentation today um, and I am going to do my best to track and answer all of your questions as you um, have them throughout the presentation. So with that, Sandy. Very good, thanks, Sarah. Well, good morning, everybody. As Sarah mentioned today, our, fo our focus is gonna be on Myosha's reporting, recording, and records requirement as it relates to COVID-19. So for those who joined us last week, you we talked generally that there are no Myosha standards that are specific to COVID-19. So for example, right, the, um, the agency, um, the Myosha agency has not issued any uh, temporary rules that specifically say, hey, employers, this is how you need to handle COVID-19 in the workplace. And so we have to draw from the existing standards um, on what your requirements are as an employer to keep your workplace safe. And so we've um, taken a handful of those standards and we're gonna kind of just do a COVID-19 view on how those might apply to your COVID-19 uh, workplace life right now. Um, so the first of those is talking about uh, the part 11 standard, which includes the recording and reporting of occupational injuries and illness. So let's just generally talk about the purpose of this particular standard. So of course, from the agency's perspective, right, all of these standards give them an avenue for enforcement, right, which means um, employers, hey, if you're, if you're not doing the things you need to do here, we have the ability to issue you citations and so forth. But also, right, um, requiring employers to keep certain, um, to make certain, certain records related to occupational injury and illness allows the agency to develop information about the cause and prevention of occupational injuries and illness, allows the agency to kind of compile statistics related, related to occupational safety, which generally, right, they would then use to say, hey, do we need to develop a new standard? Because as we look across the United States workforce, or particularly here in Michigan, we see an uptick in these types of injuries or illness. And, the, and we found um, based on inspections and investigations, the best way to prevent that from happening is X, Y, Z, so let's make that a standard. So that's a little bit of kind of the calculus behind the scenes. And of course, from the employer standpoint, right, the, the reporting and recording purpose should be that this thought of, 
if, if you're tracking those accidents and injuries, that um, is going to be something that helps you prevent them in the future, right? So it helps you identify and correct hazards in your own workplace. It allows you to better administer your own safety and health programs, and it brings employee awareness, right? So um, employees are certainly more likely to follow safe work practices and report workplace hazards when you have those types of structures in place. Okay, next slide, please. So let's just talk before we get into the difference between reporting and recording, um, because there is a difference. I wanna just generally talk about a couple of things. Okay, so all employers have a reporting obligation, and I want you to think about reporting um, as when you, you know, pick up the phone and call my OSHA and tell them about something kind of in a quick um, type of turnaround time. That's a report to my OSHA. Recording is, do I have to document this as a workplace injury or illness? So that's the difference. So to be clear, all employers have reporting obligations, and we'll talk about what those are. Um, but there are some employers that do not have recording obligations, and those are employers um, of organizations with 10 or fewer employees in certain exempt industries. And so I know that there's a number of attendees um, on the call today um, with occupational uh, safety and health type of roles in the organization, um, and so certainly um, most of you know, right, if you do not have that recording obligation, um, generally it's, it's the small employer type of, um, type of exemption. But really the general point, kind of this overarching theme related to MIOSHA reporting and recording is this overarching idea of work-relatedness. Okay, next slide please. And so I wanna just take a couple of minutes and talk about this because there's not every um, type of injury or illness that your employees experience. Are you required to pick up the phone and call my OSHA or um, make a, uh, a record, you have a record keeping requirement, right? So if Sandy Andre has the flu, nobody at Miller Jan Johnson has to pick up the phone and call my OSHA or, or write it on their um, my OSHA record keeping documents, right? So it's, it's this idea of work relatedness. And so generally, um, you need to look at work relatedness from a consideration of what is going on in your work environment, so your workplace, right, that's either causing or contributing to that injury or illness or is significantly aggravating a pre-existing injury. And so um, generally, injury and illnesses resulting from events or exposures occurring in the work environment are generally presumed to be work-related, okay? So this is hard. How, how do you decide that, right? And so generally, you want to evaluate the employee's work duties and their environment to decide whether um, any events or exposures contributed to that resulting condition or significantly aggravated a pre-existing condition, okay? So, um, so it's really a, a deeper dive into, okay, what was going on in the work environment? Um, you know, when Sandy Andre contracted the flu, right? Just, that's just a general example. What was going on in the work environment that maybe exacerbated that um, or caused or contributed to it um, or significantly aggravated any kind of um, pre-existing injury or illness she had? So that's just a very general example. And so as I mentioned, generally injury or illnesses that happen related to events or exposures in the work environment are presumed to be work-related, right? So um, if I break my arm, Arm here at Miller Johnson um, um, because I fall off a ladder, we're going to assume that that's work related subject to some very specific exceptions. Next slide, please. And here is the entire list of exceptions, right? And so um, this is directly from uh, the MIOSHA standard that talks about you're not, um, it is appropriate for you to consider these types of injuries as not being work related, right? So um, at the time of the injury or illness, the employee was present at the work environment as a member of the general public rather than as an employee. 
So if I um, am here at Miller Johnson and I'm meeting with my own personal attorney on a personal matter, right, and I come into our public space and I trip and fall while I'm up there um, meeting with, with my personal attorney, that's not anything that's going to be recordable or reportable um, on Miller Johnson's standpoint related to my injury. That's just an example. So there's a list here of nine ex exceptions, and I want to draw your attention to exception H. The illness is the common cold or flu, and of course, it's the example I used just a couple of minutes ago, um, but generally, right, that's not going to be a recordable or reportable type of illness, and it has a note here. Contagious diseases such as TB, um, Hep A, or the plague are considered work-related if the employee is infected at work, and so this is where this comes in. Um, federal OSHA, and last week we talked about the relationship between federal OSHA and my OSHA. Federal OSHA has come out and said, um, hey, employers, you should not be thinking of COVID-19, right, like the cold or flu, um, because we know that um, for state plans, you generally have an exception in your work-relatedness evaluation or analysis that says um, it's okay, you, you can just presume those are not work-related. They have come out and said COVID-19 should not be thought of that way, so you need to do a deeper dive into work-relatedness um, to make those determinations. Okay, so again, just generally wanted to talk about this overarching idea of work-relatedness so that you knew um, what was going to trigger your reporting and reporting uh, requirements under the MIOSHA standard. So now let's go ahead and turn to the specific reporting requirement. So as I said, I want you to think about reporting as I'm picking up the phone and I'm making a direct report to my OSHA regarding something that has happened in our workplace, okay? And so as I mentioned, all employers are required to notify my OSHA um, to, to make that report to them in uh, three kind of uh, groups of circumstances. So if you have a fatality in your workplace, um, that you are required to uh, make a report to MIOSHA within eight hours of you learning of that fatality, okay? This next group, uh, MIOSHA uh, groups, groups these types of injuries, uh, type of catastrophic events into kind of one group. So an inpatient hospitalization, an amputation, or a loss of eye, you are required to make a report to MIOSHA within 24 hours of, um, as a result of a work-related incident. Um, you need to make that report to MIOSHA. Again, work-related is, is the overarching theme here. And then occupational disease you are required to make a report within 10 days. And the occupational disease requirement um, is actually a requirement that doesn't live in the MIOSHA standards. It's actually a function of the public health code. Um, and so the process for that is a little bit different, but we'll, we'll go through all of those pieces. So remember, all employers have the requirement to make the report to MIOSHA, even if you are one of those, um, what I'll, I'll just call uh, small employers that are exempt from the record keeping uh, requirements that, um, and you don't have to keep those records. Um, so that's important. Generally, employers do not have to make a report if um, a fatality, inpatient hospitalization, amputation, loss of eye, so on and so forth, resulted from a motor vehicle accident on a public street or highway unless um, it's related to construction zone uh, work. If it occurred on a commercial or public transportation system, airline or bus, or the hospitalization involved diagnostic testing or observation only. So we're talking about inpatient hospitalization um, with the focus on uh, tr treatment and care, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the methods because the methods, depending on the uh, group um, or the um, whichever group um, the particular catastrophic event falls into, there's different reporting requirements. So if you are reporting a, uh, a fatality, right, the death of an employee from a work-related incident, you must report that fatality by phone. Um, and that phone number is listed here, and certainly you can find uh, that information on the MIOSHA website as well. If you are, um, within 24 hours if you're reporting um, an inpatient hospitalization, amputation, loss of eye related to a work-related um, work incident, there's a couple of different ways that you can report that to MIOSHA. 
you can contact um, a local MIOSHA office. Um, you can just pick up the phone if you have a regular contact, as an example, you can you can make a report there. Um, there is a, a toll-free number there that you can call as well, or there is an online reporting form um, that kind of walks you through all of, all of the questions um, that Myosha would ask you if you were making the report by phone. And then occupational disease, remember we talked about that was a little bit different, actually a function um, of the public health code. Um, but generally, um, an employer is required, um, and not just an employer actually, um, healthcare facilities, physicians, so on and so forth, any individual um, who, um, who um, understands occupational uh, disease, right, a work-related, so uh, if an employee is presenting symptoms characteristic of occupational disease that they believe um, resulted from some type of uh, specific exposure in the workplace is required to make a report within 10 days um, to um, um, into LEO, which is now LEO, the Labor and Economic Opportunity uh, Department within, um, within the state government. And so the form to do that is also attached here. Certainly if you are sending one of your employees to, um, you know, for treatment related to occupational disease, you can um, print that form out and send it with them and the physician can complete it, um, or, or you can coordinate that in some other way. That's fine as well. Next slide, please. So as we talked about, um, right, uh, generally, um, the question becomes, right, wh what if I don't know, right? If, I, if, if somebody goes to the hospital today and I, or they went, you know, a week ago and I'm just finding out, out about it today, I've certainly passed that 24 hour piece and so what happens? And so certainly um, the goal is within 24 hours of when you become aware of it, right? So for inpatient hospitalizations, as an example, um, you want to make that report to my OSHA, but certainly within 24 hours of you becoming aware of the employer becoming aware of it, that's really important. Fatalities are a little bit different because certainly if somebody um, experiences a, a workplace incident right now, um, they um, could uh, be receive care and, and perhaps they, they don't pass away for a time. And so from a my OSHA standard standpoint, they consider um, this a reportable event if a fatality occurs within 30 days of the work-related incident, right? And it's, it's, it's generally related to whatever that incident is, um, that you then need to go ahead and make that report to my OSHA, again, still within that same eight-hour time frame, within eight hours of when you become aware. Okay, next slide, please. And so generally, um, what, what will happen um, and what information you'll need to have handy um, is, is just general, general information about the employee, your workplace, and the particular incident. So your business name, the location and time of the work-related incident, um, what type of reportable event it was. So is this a fatality? Is this an inpatient hospitalization, amputation, loss of eyes, so on and so forth? The number of employees affected, right? And so, if um, you know, if if there was a, a chemical leak or something like that, and a, a number you had to send a number of your employees, um, you know, to the hospital, um, and, and they were all receiving inpatient care, you'll want to let uh, Myosha know that it was kind of a broader incident. Of course, um, the name of the employees um, affected the location and time of the incident, and then of course a brief description of the incident and then providing your contact information. Certainly a report um, to my OSHA re, um, regarding a fatality or one of these types of catastrophic events is likely to generate an inspection, right? So that's generally what's going to happen. Certainly with a fatality, um, a fatality report, um, those inspections and investigations will, will happen more quickly, right? There, there's a more urgent need to make sure, um, gosh, what is the condition in the workplace that caused an employee to die? And so that's much more urgent. Um, however, it's certainly possible 
um, that um, an inspection or investigation would be relatively straightforward um, in that way and may not result in a citation. As an example, if I am working here at my desk and I suffer um, you know, a heart attack or something um, and I end up passing away and an investigation reveals that it, 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 you know, I, I wasn't doing anything particularly strenuous, it was some, simply related to you know, maybe an undiagnosed issue or a pre-existing issue, um, it's likely that a situation like that, right, wouldn't wouldn't result in any kind of uh, myosha citation, particularly as as long as you followed all of the reporting requirements in in those types of pieces. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about re reporting and we understand our more immediate uh, reporting obligations, there, let's go ahead and turn to myosha's recording requirement. And so. Um, again, we want to think of recording more as record keeping, so a document. There's a document I have to do something with rather than um, that I keep and retain and maybe make available to a MIOSHA inspector or even my employees, but there's no immediate contact I need to uh, make with MIOSHA. So that's how I want us to think about record keeping generally. So again, um, and not to keep belaboring this point here, but I just want to be really clear, um, employers with more than 10 employees have these record keeping obligations. We've talked about what um, those exceptions uh, uh, might be. But generally, your record keeping type of uh, obligations revolve around three specific forms, the MIOSHA 301, the MIOSHA 300, and the MIOSHA 300A. Um, and I'm a type A personality, and it makes me nuts that these are listed in this order, but I promise you there's a method to my madness because this is the way I want you to think about how you would actually complete these forms. This is the order um, that, that makes sense to complete the forms even though they're listed, not chronologically, which makes me crazy too, but I know you'll bear with me. <laughs> okay, next slide please. So generally, um, you are required to uh, record um, work-related uh, occupational injury or illness as long as it meets certain um, what they call recording criteria and it's work-related, okay? And so uh, generally, um, those work-related uh, criteria, um, we'll talk about those in just a second, but again, it involves this kind of work-related analysis. And so the folks who are on the call who have a general awareness of what their recording obligations are related to those three forms we just talked about, uh, you know, uh, what what the um, general specific um, recording criteria look like in that work-related analysis. Um, and we're not necessarily going to go over that in depth today, but what we're going to talk about is when COVID-19 may trigger your recording requirements. So back in May, uh, federal OSHA, um, we remember we talked about there are no specific uh, standards related to COVID-19, um, but the agencies kind of give us information through various guidance documents. And back in May, they issued a, um, some enforcement guidance that was specific to this issue, right? Specific to an employer's obligation to record cases of COVID-19. And they said, um, hey, employers, as you're trying to evaluate whether um, when your employee tests positive for COVID-19, whether that's a recordable um, or generally reportable um, type of situation, here's how we want you to go through that analysis. So they've said employers are responsible for recording cases if all of the following requirements are met. The case is a confirmed case. So this is if your employee tests positive, not um, I'm experiencing symptoms and I'm going to go home um, and I'm never going to get tested or maybe even my healthcare professional advises I don't need to be tested and I'm going to go home and, and I'm going to self-isolate until, uh, you know, I'm symptom-free for a period of time. So we're talking about confirmed cases as the first criteria, whether it's work-related as the second criteria, and whether the case involves one or more of the recording criteria, so three pieces there. Confirmed case, work-related, meets recording criteria. And so for those on the call who are generally familiar with that recording criteria, we know um, that for uh, injury or illness to be recordable, it has to result in death, days away from work, restricted work or transfer to another job, medical treatment beyond first aid, 
loss of consciousness, or significant injury or illness diagnosed by a licensed healthcare professional, even if it doesn't result in death, days away from work, restricted job or job transfer, so on and so forth. So for our purposes, I want to just for COVID-19 purposes, right, I, the focus is really on this work-related piece because whether COVID-19, um, whether your employee's COVID-19 is a confirmed case, that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. They're either going to have a positive test or they're not. Um, so that criteria, we can kind of check that off, um, not, not a ton of analysis that needs to go in that. As related to the third criteria, talking about whether it meets one of those recorded criteria, right? Generally, somebody with a confirmed case is going to have days away from work, right? Because um, we are following here in Michigan, we're following Executive Order 36. In addition, um, which um, is public policy of the state that anybody who is um, even experiencing symptoms, but certainly a confirmed case stays out of the workplace for a number of days, um, but also Executive Order 145 that specifically tells us, hey, employers, you cannot let your employee back in, <laughs> right? Once they're confirmed positive, they have to meet these certain criteria before you even have to let them return to work. So generally, um, one of your employees testing positive for COVID-19, they're going to check that first box and that third box kind of right out of the gate. And so then our, the bulk of our evaluation will, will hinge on the work-related piece. So let's talk about that. Next slide, please. So we talked about, um, you know, several slides ago, generally that we want to focus on duties and those types of things. But what is extremely helpful here is that OSHA has even, uh, federal OSHA has provided even a little bit more guidance to us on generally what are the types of questions or data that we need to be gathering to make this analysis as it relates to COVID-19. So that's particularly helpful. And so they've provided uh, these three questions, okay? Um, ask the employee how the employee believed he or she contracted COVID-19, right? So, hey, Sandy, how, how did you contract COVID-19? Well, um, my spouse has it, or my mom has it, or someone I live with has it, or someone I've been in close contact has it. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a good, helpful piece of information. Generally discuss the employee's out, uh, work and out of work activities that may have, le may have led to the illness. And so with respect to that inquiry, you know, we want to respect the employee's privacy. We don't want to give them, um, you know, have them go through an interrogation about how they've been spending their time, but just a general inquiry of, hey, um, you know, have you traveled outside of this area? Have you been to large gatherings? Um, are you um, are are you taking any precautions when you're doing those things, such as face coverings or you know social distancing? Just a general inquiry there uh, makes sense. And then you're going to want to review the employee's work environment for potential COVID-19 exposure. So this should be, from an employer's uh, standpoint and point of view, this should be informed by any other instances of workers in that same environment who've contracted COVID-19. Okay, and so um, again, as I, I give the example of myself right here at Miller Johnson, um, if I'm um, the only person here in my little uh, work area, you know, right? Nobody else on my floor, nobody else in the organization, nobody else at this, you know, at the Grand Rapids office. But you know, whatever those pieces are, um, nobody else has tested positive or has um, stayed away from the workplace because they're reporting symptoms. That's an important data point for Miller Johnson to know, right? So. Um, that's a helpful fact from the standpoint of, well, there seems to be pretty low opportunity for Sandy con to contract that here at work, um, just based on the fact that we have no information about other uh, confirmed cases in our work environment or even anyone who's experiencing symptoms. So all of those pieces together um, help kind of shape um, whether we think that um, your employee contracting COVID-19 um, was, um, was exacerbated by their presence in your workplace, right? So if we go back to that original kind of definition of work-relatedness, we talk about um, whether the illness, um, if the event or exposure in the work environment either caused or contributed to that condition or aggravated the pre-existing condition. So, so these 
three questions. Federal OSHA has told us these are the three questions and the types of inquiries you should be making to help inform that analysis. So OSHA also has said they're not expecting employers to, you know, undertake ex extensive medical inquiries right with their employees and and their. Um, they understand that employees um, have privacy concerns um, and that none of us are public health contact tracers, right? They, they understand that. So they're not, they're not asking you to do that, but they're asking you to do um, what's listed here, um, at least to take a sufficient inquiry um, related to the work-relatedness analysis. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about um, then OSHA's expectations. So generally they've said, hey, if an employer is making a good faith inquiry to determine if an employee who's contracted COVID-19, if, if um, them contracting it, it was work related, then we are going to say they, they did enough, right? They, they, they asked they asked the right questions. It wasn't just, you know, words on paper. They actually went through the exercise and they did those things. And based on the information that was available to the employer that they got from the employee, the investigation they did on their own, and they and the employer couldn't determine whether it was more likely than not that the exposure happened in the workplace then the employer is fine to make the determination um, that the COVID-19 illness does not meet that work-relatedness requirement and then they are neither required to report or record, okay? And so as we look at um, reasonableness of the employer's own investigation, the evidence available to the employer, evidence that COVID-19 was contracted at work, you know, what other things are important. So, of course, we know here in Michigan, we have the My Safe Start dashboard, and so we know that the state has um, been divided into regions, and we have a general idea of the risk level associated with those regions. We have county information available to us. Depending on where you are, you may even have local city or municipality data available to you to know, hey, are we in an area of wide community spread? Is, is the location, is the zip code I'm sitting in right now considered a, a COVID hotspot? All of those types of pieces, okay? And so um, Federal OSHA has said, you know, this isn't a ready formula, you know, if X plus Y equals seven, then the answer is yes, nothing like that. It's, it's rather taking different types of evidence that might weigh in favor of or against work-relatedness. And they've actually provided a couple of examples that they say, you know, for example, it's more likely that an employee who's contracted COVID, um, that it was related to a workplace exposure. If you have several cases that develop among workers who work closely together and there's no alternative explanation, then it's, it's appropriate for you to say that the COVID-19 illness is more likely to be work-related. Or another example, an employee's COVID-19 illness is contracted shortly after a lengthy or close exposure to a particular customer or coworker who also has a confirmed case and there's no alternative explanation. Or even an employee's duties have frequent close contact exposure to the general public in a location with significant ongoing community transmission and there's no alternative explanation. All of those pieces kind of turn the tide to a more likely than not. As an alternative example, it's less likely, right, if, if Sandy is the only worker to contract COVID-19 in my vicinity and my job duties do not require me to have frequent contact with the general public, regardless of community spread. So even if we happen maybe to be in a hot spot, um, if, if my job duties don't even require me to interact with the public and nobody else in my work vicinity has contracted or expressed symptoms, then it's it's perfectly appropriate for the employer to make the determination that you know my COVID-19 illness is not work-related. Or if as you're going through and you're having this conversation with the employee um, to the extent that you can, you learn that outside of the workplace, right, the employee uh, closely or frequently associates with somebody who either was COVID positive 
um, who was not a, a coworker, and um, the, the employee was exposed to that person during the period when that person would have become infectious. So if you learn, right, um, that, that they've been in close contact with somebody um, who has tested positive or who's experiencing symptoms during that infectious period and absent any other work-related information, it's perfectly appropriate for you to go ahead and make that determination that it's not work-related. And it's also perfectly appropriate for employers to give, um, you know, weight to evidence related to cause that you might, you might get from um, medical providers or public health authorities or the employee themselves, right? So if the employee says, I think I got this from Aunt Susie um, because I went to her 80th birthday party, that's, that's appropriate. Or when you're engaging with local public health officials, um, you know, they in any way provide information related to the employee, the causation of that particular employee's illness, it's appropriate for you to rely upon that. Here, documentation is going to be your friend, right? Um, and so um, at Miller Johnson, we are developing a kind of work relatedness. Um, questionnaire um, that we will post in our resource center that um, is an opportunity for you to kind of take a deep dive related to these inquiries. Um, but whether you use our form or your own form, it's important for you um, as part of kind of your positive test protocol, here's one more thing you have to do, right, um, is just to make sure that you're spending some time asking the right questions and documenting that you took the time to investigate um, because when you don't record and you don't report, um, the, the burden is going to be on you to say, we thought we didn't have to because this is the information we knew at the time, okay? Okay. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about, you heard me talk about um, the 301, the 300, and the 300A, and I'm going to just quickly uh, quickly run through these and then give you a peek at those forms just in case you're not familiar with them. So once you make the determination that an injury or illness meets the recording requirements, there are three forms you need to think about, like I mentioned. So um, when we talk about uh, the 301, 300, and the 300A, the 301 form is the one that is most uh, specific to the employee, has the most employee-specific information rather than just information related to their particular illness, okay? And so uh, the 301 is called the Injury and Illness Incident Report. You need to complete it within seven days after you receive information that's recordable, um, that you, you know that it's a work-related recordable injury, and this is a record you need to keep in your workplace for five years. So you don't need to send this to anyone. You you just need to have it available at, um, at your workplace, okay? So if we go to the next slide, we'll just take a quick peek um, of what this form looks like. And the link to this particular document is right there at the bottom as well. So this is right on uh, the Labor um, and Economic Opportunity website for you to complete. And as you see, it's, it's general basic information related to the employee and then information related to the employee's injury or illness. Pretty straightforward. So I always say do this one first um, because the information on this form is going to inform uh, the information that you put on the other two. So now let's turn to the next form, the MIOSHA 300 form. This is a log of work-related injuries and illnesses that you use the form from the 301 to, to kind of more summarize or categorize uh, the type of injury or illness um, that your employee is experiencing. So less employee specific information on this form, but the same type of time period needing to do that within seven days of, of making the work relatedness determination. And again, this is a record to keep at your workplace um, and you need to retain that for five years. Um, and we'll go to the next slide so you can take a peek at what that particular form looks like in the website uh, for, uh, for that form right on the LEO website. And I'll tell you, um, and again, for the, uh, for the safety folks who may be on the call today, you certainly know that um, when MIOSHA makes an inspection at your workplace related to, you know, an occupational injury or illness or investigating a complaint or just a scheduled inspection, whatever that case may be, one of the first things that inspector is going to do is ask for your MIOSHA 300 uh, log. Um, so it's important uh, that the folks who are in charge of completing these things and making those analysis uh, are, are doing that and, and you know what your retention requirements are. Next slide, please. 
Now let's go ahead and talk about the 300A. The 300A is your summary. Um, and so all employers, all covered employers, must complete the summary even if there are no injuries or illnesses that occurred during the year. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you'll complete this kind of, um, right, so at the end of 2020 as an example, you'll look back and say, okay, this uh, document is where we're going to uh, quantify all of the uh, recordable workplace illnesses or injuries that we've experienced at this uh, workplace um, over this year. And we're going to put all of this information here. So it's reflecting the prior year's the calendar year's work-related injury or illnesses. It's not tied to your company's fiscal year or operating year, any of those things. It's, it's purely a calendar year look back. It must be certified by a company executive, and so that might um, that might be the, the person who's completing um, the other forms on a, on a day-to-day -day basis as well, but it must this must be certified by an executive at the company, and it actually has a posting requirement. So employers are required to post this on an annual basis from February 1st to April 30th. Um, in an area wherever workplace notices to workers are usually posted. So, for example, if you have um, employment law posters um, in a break room or near a time clock or, or whatever it is, that's, that's a perfectly appropriate location for something like this. And so if we go to the next slide, you'll have a peek at what that form looks like and the web address for it. And so you can see here, it's much more of a summary form. How many cases, how many days away um, of work uh, did folks miss? What were the different types of injury or illnesses that um, happened at our workplace this year? Okay. Now that we've finished uh, reporting and recording, we are going to go ahead and transition into records. Next slide, please. So um, the MIOSHA standard that applies here generally uh, mirrors the federal standard, and it's generally um, called, uh, or the, the focus, right, the purpose is kind of this access. So uh, access to certain exposure records and certain medical records. Um, and so uh, from a MIOSHA standpoint, the uh, the actual standard name, excuse me, is uh, MIOSHA Part 70 Employee Medical Records and Trade Secrets, kind of a funny name, but it generally mirrors uh, the federal access to exposure and medical records uh, standard for federal OSHA. And generally the purpose um, of this standard is preservation and access, saying, hey employers, if you have records like this, you are required to keep them and preserve them in a certain way, and you are required to allow certain people access to those records. The good news about this standard is it does not require an employee to create any particular record, only if these types of records already exist in the course of your business that you understand that you have um, you now are required to provide a right of access to these records um, so, um, so that for individuals generally, right, because uh, there's some kind of inquiry going on related to detection, treatment, or prevention of occupational disease, and you are generally required to retain these records for the duration of the individual's employment plus 30 years. So those are the general requirements. So in addition to keeping records and providing access, the standard also requires employers to notify employees who are exposed to, for example, toxic substances and harmful physical agents. Um, and, and they can do that through the types of records they keep. So for example, probably most of us on this call, um, you may be during, um, from an annual standpoint or during our new hire orientation period, they said, uh, your employer said, hey, Sandy, this is your job. And in the course of your job, you are going to have access to, to some toxic substances or hazardous chemicals. And here are the record, here are where the records related to those things here is where those are kept. Right. So you and I might know those as uh, safety data sheets and things like that. Um, and so when we're talking about exposure, your employer is required to keep track of the individuals in the workplace who may have exposure to those types of substances and uh, provide you information related to those types of substances. But for our purposes, um, as it relates to COVID-19, I want to specifically focus on the medical record portion of this requirement. And so 
the medical record uh, type of requirement talks about um, for certain medical records, hey, employers, again, if you are already retain or keeping these or making these, you now have to provide access um, to them and you have to retain them. And so the standard specifically defines what a medical record is. So if we can go to the next slide, we can just take a quick look of the standard says, yes, these types of things are medical records. Um, for purposes of this standard, not related to any other standard or any other law, right? I want to be clear. And these types of records are not medical records. And so from a COVID-19 standpoint, the very first thing, um, the very first couple things, right, um, on that yes list um, kind of put up a flag in my mind going, oh, right, we might now, um, even though we hadn't ever before, we might now have records that are considered medical and employment questionnaires or histories or results of medical exams and laboratory test results, right? Because maybe, um, right, we're doing these daily entry screenings and depending on how they're done, they might fall into this category. Um, or maybe now we are testing all of our employees on a daily or weekly basis. Um, regardless of whether they're exhibiting symptoms or we send people for testing when they do, right? You know, our workplace is very different than it was six months or a year ago or how we usually operate. And so it's certainly uh, probable that we may be now creating records that we hadn't in the past. So when we talk about, right, what a medical record is, um, it is a record concerning any medical tests examinations or the health status of the employee, but the most important qualifier here for our purposes is that it is a record that is made or maintained by a physician, nurse, technician, or other health care personnel. So if, you know, Sandy Andre as the safety officer or the human resources person um, or the office manager is the one charged with doing these daily entry screenings and, and that's the extent of the type of records uh, that we may be keeping, um, those do not qualify as medical records as it relates to the standard. And so there is no requirement from a retention standpoint, from a MIOSHA standpoint, that I need to retain these records for 30 years. However, with records like that, I do still have a retention requirement under various executive orders. So I wanna be clear that here, we're just specifically talking about this MIOSHA standard. Next slide, please. And one more. And so, as I mentioned, what type of COVID-19 related workplace records could, could be a medical record under this particular standard? And a couple of things came to mind. Your daily entry screenings, um, which we just talked about, maybe temperature check records, COVID-19 screening records and test results, or records concerning an employee's work-related exposure to COVID-19, right? So if we're keeping any of those types of records, if they are maintained by a physician, nurse, or other healthcare personnel or technician, they meet the definition of employee medical records under this MIOSHA standard, and we now have access and retention requirements. But again, the qualifier here is who does the maintaining of those types of records, okay? Um, and so, Generally, when I think about this and how those records may, these types of COVID-19 related records may fall under the standard, it's generally um, if you are in an organization, as an example, that has an occupational health type of function um, and they are keeping these types of records in kind of the scope of, of the general functions that they, that they uh, provide uh, to, to the employer, okay? And so those records certainly meet this criteria, um, but unless you fall into one of those categories, physician, nurse, or other healthcare professional or technician, it is not a medical record. So I would say for the large majority of us, right, our daily entry screenings did not just um, transition to an OSHA medical record overnight without us knowing it, right? So, so generally that is not the case, and so that's a bit of good news but wanting to put this on your radar screen. Okay, we are at the end of our content, so let's go ahead and transition to questions.
Thank you, Sandy, so much. That was uh, um, such great and helpful information. We do have some questions. Some of them I'm going to need your help with. Um, for those who are listening, Sandy really is the OSHA, my OSHA expert. Um, and so we're going to get her help today with some of these questions. We, we have a couple of questions that um, sort of relate to um, the interplay between OSHA and my OSHA. So the, so the first question is, are these requirements and guidelines for COVID federal requirements for all states or just my OSHA for Michigan? And I would imagine some of our listeners are wondering this because they might have um, locations in states other than Michigan. So Sandy, do you, do you wanna speak to that? Sure, yep. So the good news here is that the Michigan requirements related to reporting and recording and particularly the medical record and exposure records that we were just talking about, there is a federal OSHA um, kind of counterpart to that. They may differ in a couple of different ways. Remember that the, um, various states can have their own state plans, but they have to be at least as kind of stringent as the federal guidelines. Um, so federal OSHA has standards, has these exact standards, right? They might not be numbered the same um, and necessarily require the same, but there is certainly a reporting requirement for occupational illness, injury, um, and, and fatality, catastrophic um, types of events. There is definitely a recording um, um, requirement and in the forms at the federal level are just simply called the OSHA 300, the OSHA 301 instead of the my OSHA, and then the access to employee medical records that is a federal standard as well. And when we talked about kind of the general work relatedness related to COVID um, kind of analysis when we're specifically talking about kind of reporting and rec uh, recording requirements. The good news there is that that guidance actually came from federal OSHA. And so we're kind of taking that and running with it here in Michigan because Michigan OSHA has not yet spoke on that, right? So the only guidance we have related to COVID and our requirements under those standards have come from federal OSHA. So we're, we're um, encouraging uh, Michigan employers to follow that, but for those with employees in other states, um, absent your particular state having a state plan that has said something different than federal OSHA, it is perfectly appropriate for you to rely on the guidance get, we're getting from federal OSHA too. So from a, for a practical matter, Sandy, if um, an organization is completing the federal OSHA 300-301 and 300-A forms, do they also have to fill out the same MyOSHA forms or is it sufficient to complete just the OSHA forms? If you're a Michigan employer, you should uh, complete the Michigan forms. And if you're in, if your work site that you're kind of reporting that particular employee's work location um, is in a uh, is in a state with a state plan, you should complete their forms. Um, Again, I think generally you're, you're not going to get a slap on the hand if, if you accidentally complete the OSHA 300 instead of the my OSHA 300, but to the extent that you complete the right form, um, that'll, that'll be helpful to you. Yes. Yeah, so in other words, you don't have to do, if, if, you, if it's oh, a okay. state in which OSHA has given the, the state agency authority to investigate um, like in Michigan, for example, it's sufficient to just do it once. You do it on the MyOSHA form rather than the OSHA form. Um, if we conduct daily health screenings for every employee before they report to duty, are these considered employee medical records if an RN is the one who takes their temperature? And the answer is those are considered employee medical records for the purposes of your obligation to keep that information confidential um, under the ADA, for example, or any other state law that requires confidentiality. Um, and so, yes, you should be keeping those um, records confidential as much as possible. Um, doo, doo, doo. And it looks like we had another similar question like that. 
would contact tracing records fall under this standard if our results show no spread at work? Um, and the answer to that, I, I'm not sure which standard you're referring to in terms of reporting or recording. Um, I, it, I don't believe it, it would fall under an ob, a, a specific obligation to record it or report it. However, we would certainly strongly encourage you to keep those records um, because what that's showing is that a case of COVID did not spread. So if a coworker thereafter does have COVID, right, you, you might be able to demonstrate that that wasn't a workplace issue. Sounds like maybe, Sandy, are, are you back on? I'm back, sorry about that. Yeah, no problem, it's all right. Um, one question that I just answered, Sandy, and I'm curious about your thoughts, is whether, whether you think contact tracing records would fall under this standard if they show no spread at work. In other words, the records demonstrated that an employee might have had COVID, but that um, nobody else was in close contact with that person. If I think that they fall under um, the medical record standard? I think so. I think that's what they were referring to. Yeah, nope, nope, they wouldn't. Again, remember from a, well, it depends, right? If, if it's the employer doing the contract tracing and they're not a physician, um, a nurse or other healthcare professional, remember none of those records fall under that um, access and exposure medical record standard. So, so you're in good pieces there. Um, from just a general contact tracing when you're doing your inquiry regarding uh, work relatedness, that doesn't transition to an OSHA medical record either um, just because you're doing that inquiry. Got it. And then Sandy, what, what if an employer has an RN doing that daily health screening? Is, does yeah. that make that information a medical record? Yeah, it definitely could. It definitely could. So um, if, if the RN, right, if the physician, nurse, or other healthcare professional or technician is the one um, maintaining that record, um, and the record um, concerns the medical test examination or health status of an employee, which OSHA says that medical questionnaires can, um, and we're keeping a record, um, right, of I don't have these symptoms, this is my temperature, Yes, that can become an OSHA record. Got it. Um, okay, just, just a few more. If an employee is under quarantine for um, symptoms, so, so this is an employee that has symptoms of COVID but has not been tested, would it be a recordable case if there's no positive tests, but the doctor saying, um, it could be COVID? Nope, it wouldn't be reportable or recordable. So, right, um, I, sh I should back up on the reportable piece. Presuming the person is not in patient hospitalization, right? And I would presume that if someone isn't even um, getting a positive diagnosis, they're Correct. not to that level. Right. But just to be clear, right? Um, but from a recording standpoint, no. Um, right. So remember that those uh, those criteria, there were three. It had to be a confirmed case of COVID. The case had to be work related and it had to involve one or more of those recorded criteria. So even though we have somebody um, who is missing days at work and maybe we do do the, you know, analysis related to work related, if it's not a confirmed case, it's still not recordable. Um, you know, certainly if we have an employee saying, hey, I think I contracted it at work, even though OSHA or, or my OSHA isn't required us to do that work-related evaluation, it probably makes sense for us to, to do a little bit of that on our own, just to make sure um, that we're doing our part to not expose um, other employees um, so that we remain in the good graces of our obligations under the general duty clause. Yep, perfect. Okay. Um... What should, should we be keeping internal records if an event is not recordable? Do you yes, want to I be think keeping they, any yeah. records to support that or um, is that sort of at their discretion based on the circumstances? 
Yep, you're definitely not required to keep any records, right, if it's not recordable. However, remember we talked about when we, um, when we were talking about kind of the, the guidance we've gotten from federal OSHA related to the reasonableness of the employer's inquiry on the work-related piece, you're yeah. going to want to have enough of something that shows, hey, <laughs> we didn't record it because we at least engaged in an inquiry of some kind, and this is the information we generally learn right. from that inquiry that led us to say, nope, this is not recordable. To conclude that um, it wasn't recordable. Yeah, that, that makes exactly. all the sense in the world. Okay, and just one last question. We had this from a couple of folks. Um, what if I um, am an employer um, in Michigan, but I also have employees in other states, okay? Do we record an event on our MIOSHA form if the employee is located in a different state, if you know. Yeah, yep. So generally, um, some of those work-related forms go um, based on work site location. So I'd wanna learn a little bit more about the location, right? Do you have a facility there? Is there does somebody just work remotely from their home in another state? That helps kind of inform that inquiry a little bit. Um, but generally, um, at least from a recording and reporting standpoint, um, we're, we're looking at uh, work site type of information, even if you are an employer covered under MIOSHA. So I know that's really kind of tricky and confusing, um, but uh, you write by having, again, it depends on the number of people, the type of facility you have that will help determine um, whether uh, you're under that, this particular employee is under a different state plan or just uh, defaults to federal OSHA, um, or if this is a MIOSHA type of piece, it's a little bit more um, of, of an in-depth analysis on that for me to be able to give it just kind of a blanket answer. But generally, yeah. right, absent me being the only person sitting here in Michigan working for Miller Johnson, um, absent that, uh, it w you would be subject to right the the laws of of whatever state the employee is physically located in generally. Okay, and it looks like we yep. just have one one follow up question to the to the question we had related to whether those daily health screenings are a medical record. The question was so so if it would if it was our director of quality, not a medical professional that's keeping those records, would we avoid that 30 year record keeping requirement? Yep, you absolutely would, right? So if it's the director of quality and they're not a healthcare person that is making right. and maintaining those records, it is, it is out of that particular standard. Perfect, so um, for a practical matter, if you want to avoid the standard, you should be proactive and thoughtful about who's keeping those records. Exactly, but also, um, and I know I mentioned this, and, and I know you, and I know you would agree, Sarah. But just remember that just because these records don't meet this standard under MIOSHA, you do still have a retention, a record retention requirement under Executive Order 145. Right. Okay. Perfect. Regardless it's of not who, a 30 yeah. year requirement, however. <laughs> no, well, not, not, not that we know of and not yet, but um, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> okay, well, with that, we are, we are just over nine o'clock. Um, and I want to thank everyone for attending and listening today. Just a reminder, we do have all of these webinars recorded on our um, COVID page. So feel free to listen again or to let your colleagues know that they can listen in. And we will be doing our final presentation of the series next week. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye-bye.